Uh, good morning, everybody. Really happy to be here. Um, I'm actually going to, this presentation that I'm going to walk you through was first done here in, I want to say, 2018, the first WE conference. So back in 2018, I think the general public couldn't uh, even spell AI. So a lot has changed. But uh, the, the premise of this, the concerns that I had when I built this, uh, this deck originally um, have actually only amplified as we've moved forward. So I've got a, a lot more to talk about on this subject um, than I did in 2018. And I think that um, the punchline of this thing actually is what Jackie just shared. And uh, as I think about kind of if there was one message that I would have to the developers of technology, AI in particular, is uh, we need to uh, slow it down and figure some things out before this thing uh, goes too much further. Um, so I'm going to talk about why I, I think that. I'm going to share a lot of examples. And I'm going to tie it back into uh, what's going on uh, in the industry um, and tie it actually back into the reason we're all here, which is frankly uh, a lack of diversity in the tech industry, particularly gender diversity, and uh, why that's important. And I, and I think that lack of uh, gender diversity is in part why we need to pause and uh, regroup to, uh, to get this right. It's too important uh, not to get right. Um, so I, I, I've broken this down into a couple of parts. And the, the first thing I want to do is uh, talk a, a little bit more about the state today of diversity in uh, the tech industry. Um, and it, in doing that, really, you know, this, the I want to dig down deep into the stats behind uh, what's going on in tech as it, as it relates to women in tech in particular. Um, punchline there is things aren't much better than they were in 2018 when I first did this. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, definitely something to unpack and to ponder. And then I want to uh, start taking it into what's going on in technology and why I think this is important. Um, and, and then I'll, I've got some thoughts about how we can actually make this a, a bit better. Um, so as a starting point, in Silicon Valley, this is what gender diversity looks like. And this is 2,000 uh, companies that Fenwick and West uh, surveyed. So what you're looking at is about 18%. In Silicon Valley, about 18% of these 2,000 companies are women. Uh, the balance of them are men. Uh, and I'll bet nobody here is surprised that tech today is still uh, male-dominated, right? Um, and one of the, the interesting things about this is there was a bit of progress on this from 2018. Uh, this got up to about uh, 21%, and it's rolled right back to 18%, which is where it was at 2018. So in these 2,000 companies, and the, and the mix from 2018 has changed a bit, but interestingly enough, the, uh, you know, in terms of the company mix, but not the gender mix, um, I, think it, I think it's pretty interesting that it's stagnated. And there's lots of reasons for this that I, I'll, I'll touch on as we go through this. Um, none of them actually are good or acceptable reasons, in my opinion. As you pull back and you look, look at just large tech companies, I'm clearly not going to use these. <coughs> um, what you see is actually it's a bit better. So there is some progress. We're now looking at 25% of the workforce in large tech companies is uh, made up of women. But as you'll see when you relate this to kind of the whole work, uh, world of work, uh, all companies, um, tech is actually, it, w women in technology, make no mistake, horribly underrepresented, which means uh, women's point of view, uh, which means women's EQ, uh, also horribly uh, underrepresented. And I think that contributes to this larger thesis of mine. Um, as we start to look deeper into the whys of this, this is pretty interesting. This is a uh, McKenzie survey that um, uh, speaks to the differences in views between men and women about why women aren't more represented in the workforce. And so, 
uh, what, what they did is they asked for, um, they asked men and women to kind of list all of the different reasons uh, why that there's this uh, disconnect. And then they started grouping them and uh, prioritizing them based on the number of people who mentioned each of these things. And then they compared them. And that's what you're seeing is the comparison here. Um, and I'm talking about the wrong slide. Let me, let me back up. Don't forget what I just said so I don't have to say it again, because <laughs> it's, it's, it's coming up here quick. Um, when, when you look, and, and this, is, this is actually really important, when you look at how uh, women fall within the ranks um, in corporations, what you see, no, I, well, it is, I guess, a little bit of a surprise. We basically, the genders start out even. Uh, and what's, what's very interesting about these numbers, 46%, it actually turns out that uh, overall, 46 per, almost 47% actually of the workforce is women, of the overall workforce. So when you, no surprise, right? Um, when you go down a, a little bit deeper, what you find is, I don't know if, if you guys realize this, but women in the U.S. outnumber men. Uh, not by a lot. There's uh, about 51 women uh, versus 49 men out of 100. So I, you know, on the one hand, I would think that you know, there's an opportunity. That we got a little bit of leveling up to do there, but uh, pretty close. But the, the important thing is as you march forward, you start to see this gap open up pretty quickly. So about two-thirds of managers are men, one-third are women, and as you go further and further down the stack, you can see the gap uh, open up more and more. And I'm, I'm going to uh, unpack that a little bit here uh, in a minute. Um, so as we look at technology in particular, I wanted to share uh, a couple of slides of stats that I think are, are fundamental in terms of getting our head around where we are. And uh, one of the things I should say is um, on the table are uh, some surveys. It's a, the questions I've got for you guys based on things that I'm talking about here. I, I want to get people's opinion. And for those of you who actually aren't in the room, there is a uh, survey monkey that we'll uh, post a link for if you, if you want to participate in this. So um, there's no, you, you don't have to do it now. But as I go through this and you're reflecting on it, I would really love to get your thoughts uh, on some of the, I think, more important points in this presentation. And then I'm going to compile all of that, and then we'll post it out. We'll, we'll send it out to you guys so you can see. What I'm really uh, after is yeah, we've got a room full of women in technology. Um, I'd like to understand uh, your viewpoints, how connected to the, the data that I'm, I'm showing you are. So as a starting point, I'm going to go from uh, uh, worst to best. Actually, that's not true. I'm going to go from worst to worst. As I go through these two slides, I'll just I'll, I'll give you a heads up on that. But uh, when you look at uh, VC-funded companies, and uh, venture capital is still one of the predominant ways that early stage tech companies come into being. When you look at that, um, only 2% uh, it, of the VC funded companies are actually founded by women. Now, it also happens that women founders are a much, a much smaller population relative to men founders, but not, th not that small. So there is, in my opinion, a bias towards funding uh, men-led startups versus women-led startups. Um, when you look at the tech workforce, um, black, and African-American women and Latino women are even more horribly underrepresented, probably not telling you guys anything you didn't already know. 14% of the engineers, software engineers, and, and this is really important in terms of AI, uh, are women. And 15% uh, average salary shortfall to men. Um, and uh, I'll bet that pisses off everybody in this room, um, and it should. So if you look at this, the average salary shortfall this year in 2023 in the U.S., uh, women to men, it, depending on what you're reading, it runs about 15 to 17%. So this stat for the tech industry is kind of right in line with the 
uh, or it's, this is not unique um, to the tech industry. But there, when you get underneath that, there are some more shocking stats, uh, one of which is uh, African American women CEOs, 38% less than their white male counterparts. That's it. I mean, that's, that's disgusting, okay? 27% um, uh, of the uh, computing occupations in tech are made up of women um, versus a 57% uh, total professional occupations. 37 or 33% of the tech-related workforce is made up of women, and 34% of all STEM jobs are made up of women. So I'll say it again, underrepresented gender in uh, technology. Some more stats. 50% leave of women leave their jobs in technology before the age of 35. Um, and here, here we start to get a feel for why women are underrepresented in management and senior level jobs in technology. And I, in the reading I've done on this, um, one of the things that comes up constantly is the appalling state of childcare uh, in this country. Uh, and uh, that has a lot to do with this, I think. Um, and I think it's very unfortunate that we force people to make a choice between career and children. Um, obviously, children are pretty important. Um, you know, they are the future. They're especially Im important uh, for those of us that are approaching uh, Social Security collection, because that Social Security is going to be funded by uh, kids that grow up to work. Um, so we, we, we all have a, there's a lot of vested interest in this, but um, so th maybe there's a takeaway. Uh, fixing, addressing the, the gap in childcare, which tends to obviously default to the mom in the equation, um, so that we can, uh, it, it's not an either or choice. 50% report harassment and sexism, uh, more than 50%. This one uh, surprised me. I thought we were making better progress on this. And this is in the survey because I, I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands and put people on the spot, but I really am curious whether or not uh, you guys have experienced this directly or maybe indirectly through, uh, through a colleague uh, you've seen this happen. Um, you know, it, frankly, I did think this was, uh, our industry was better than this. Um, I, I thought the the only place that you could really get away with this anymore is in politics, um, which also, that's a, that's a whole other presentation, yeah. 52% of women in technology rate their work-life balance as poor, and, uh, but just for, to kind of level load here, um, it's not that much different for men. Actually, more men wake, uh, rate their work-life balance uh, is poor, so this is kind of, uh, this might be a bigger societal problem than it is a technology problem. 52 women promoted to management for every 100 men, and then of course, no surprise, 72% uh, of women in this survey uh, say they are uh, regularly outnumbered in meetings by at least uh, two to one. So again, uh, at the table where things are being decided, directions, uh, direction is being set, um, women are underrepresented. So, as I start to switch gears here, as a kind of a fundamental premise, I want to talk for a minute about this notion of tech, uh, biology creating technology. And this goes back to, uh, you know, the invention of fire, uh, picking up a sharpened stick to hunt animals. Um, we, at, at, as biological organisms, one of the, the things, maybe the, the main thing that separates us from all the organi other organisms on the Earth, is that we have developed technology to extend our capabilities, to make us more productive, whether it's you know, hunting woolly mammoths or uh, whatever it is that we're doing. Um, this, is, this is fundamental to who we are as a species. And one of the things that's very interesting to me about this is that as technology advances, it has been slowly integrating itself into biology. And there's going to come a point in our time, in our lifetimes, 
where it actually integrates into our biology. Well, where we have, we won't carry a cell phone. It'll, that de communication device, that internet connectivity that uh, we all depend on will be embedded in us. Um, and uh, there is, I mean, literally, I, I could spend an hour talking about uh, what the future of embedded technology looks like. But it's already here, and it's embedding in us in different ways. So um, one of the, the primary ways that uh, I think it's, it's infected everybody in this room, everybody I know, uh, probably everybody in uh, first world countries, is through uh, social media. Um, the more time we spend online, the more our brains are starting to rewire in very subtle ways. And uh, in that rewiring, it's affecting the way we interpret, the way we reason, the way we remember, the way we communicate. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's pretty interesting. And you see it especially in the younger generation. Um, I was listening to an interview uh, with Bruce Springsteen. And uh, one of the questions he got was, hey, do you ever go back to the old neighborhood? And he said, not anymore. Uh, it's depressing because the old neighborhood, when he was a kid, kids were outside playing. That, that you know, you had neighborhoods and, you know, each neighborhood had its own little uh, agenda, its own little flavor, and the kids were out playing and they would interact, you know, across neighborhood boundaries. He said when, last time he went through his old neighborhood, no kids on the street, and uh, all you saw was flickering lights behind windows as uh, uh, kids played online video games and that kind of a thing. And it, uh, that, that, really, that really hit home. That, of course, is absolutely going to change the way we interact and communicate. It, it has to. Um, we're highly social creatures, and um, we're becoming highly unsocial creatures. And uh, in, in my opinion, I think we're fooling ourselves if we think uh, social media relationships um, are a uh, perfect substitute for in-person relationships. So this is at the kind of the heart of what I want to talk about with respect to AI, because AI does, as you will see, have a lot of influence on how we think. And so you have this kind of soft integration happening uh, cognitively in us as a species. Uh, that is uh, pre, it, it's happening before the hard integration of uh, Elon Musk, Neuralink, and some of the other things that are, are going on. So let's, uh, let's jump right into uh, what I, uh, kind of the heart of this, which is the state of bias in uh, technology today. Um, first and foremost, I think it's important to uh, uh, get out in the open that bias is a perfectly uh, natural human trait. It's been with us uh, since the beginning of time. It's been, been with us since the beginning of people starting to uh, clump together and form uh, you know, groups and tribes you know, beyond just their uh, family borders. Um, and it is the mother of all prejudice, discrimination, and injustice, and, uh, which is, a, which is a, a pretty big statement to make. And so I'll unpack that here in the next few minutes. Bias is also hard-coded into our DNA. Um, this is, if you're familiar with the concept of Darwinism in, in how we've evolved, um, so, you know, we've evolved to stand upright and have opposable thumbs and all this other uh, great stuff, but we've also evolved in terms of our wiring uh, in a way to make us more compatible together so that we, uh, that we work together. And I'm going to take you through some of what's called uh, caveman biases, fundamental biases that absolutely affect our, our lives and are absolutely um, getting hardwired, unfortunately, into technology. Um, and so when you, when you think about uh, what, what do we have in common today with uh, cavemen? Well, we need to eat. We want to uh, procreate, you know, uh, keep the species alive. Um, we're very interested in our safety, you know, uh, uh, food security, uh, not that the cavemen had jobs, but you know, for us, job security. Security is very important. So what that, what that does is it, it predisposes us 
to look out for things that are going to undermine those things that we are most worried about. Um, and the ultimate thing it leads to is this notion of your group is best. So this is a, this is a fundamental bias, and it, it's so powerful, um, we don't even realize it. But they've done studies where, like, if I divided this room in two, like right down this middle, and I said, you're group A and you're group B, and I want you guys to get together and talk about, as a group, what differentiates you, what makes you special, and then tell me if you think your group, group B, is better than group A and group A is better than group B. I guarantee you group B would feel like they were superior to group A, not based on anything, and group A would feel like they were superior to group B, maybe based on the fact that Phil Gallagher is in group B. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's more. I had the, I had the under. <laughs> um, but it, it's not unusual where you feel so strongly about it that you end up arguing. People that you actually know and respect and are friends in, a, in your deep brain become the enemy. They become a threat. So this, this group bias this is uh, extremely important in, uh, in everything. And it, frankly, it's the reason why we've basically been in a perpetual state of war since the start of the species. It's the reason why we've got wars going on today, is, uh, it, and I, which I personally find absolutely ridiculous. Uh, you know, being that we're in the 21st century and all the things that tech is unlocking for us. But so it's, it's hard-coded into our, our DNA. And it, with bias, you have a, a conscious bias, an unconscious bias. Uh, the unconscious bias, even for the most enlightened, um, are, are pretty powerful and can kind of undermine even our enlightenment. Um, and I'm talking about Gandhi and, and Mother Teresa um, uh, struggled with their uh, biases. Um, and so, as we start to look at this deeper, one of the things that I think is uh, uh, really important is this little fact about uh, uh, how, how we think and how we make decisions. Uh, and this statement says only 5% of our cognitive activity is, uh, we're conscious of, which means 95% of it we're not. This is how the brain works. Um, it is bringing to the forefront the things that it thinks are most important for us to note in order to survive, in order for us to thrive, and it's downplaying um, the stuff that it doesn't. So this is, this is a, a really big deal, and I, I've, I've actually said this in other talks. You know, the most advanced technology by technology definition on the planet is each of you guys. You know, our brains are uh, much more advanced than the most advanced computer on the planet, and that's likely to be the case for maybe forever. You know, when you think about the human brain and what it does, um, first of all, it runs on 20 watts of power, um, and that power comes from Taco Bell, Burger King, <laughs> you know, uh, soda, etc. cetera. It's, 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 it's really unbelievable, and it's connected to a sensor array that uh, numbers literally in the billions. So all of the sensors, and, and you, they got the obvious ones, you know, taste and sight and, and all of that, um, and then a lot of not so obvious ones are flooding our brain with information all the time. And so one of the ways that the brain has evolved to deal with that is it compartmentalizes and it, it, it has you focus on the stuff that is potentially uh, threatening. Um, and because it can't look at everything, and if it did, we would be paralyzed. And by the way, there are people who suffer traumatic brain injury that, uh, that that barrier between looking at everything and looking at just a small subset of what's going on in your environment, environment uh, falls, and it's, it's horrible. Um, but what it does lead to, I mean, they have, they have perfect memory, they notice everything, they feel everything, um, it's, everything is uh, super amplified. Uh, you can't function that way. So our brains have developed in a way uh, to guide us. And, there are, and 
that is actually built on this notion of biases. It's, it's how our brains make decisions about what to act on, uh, what to put in front of us, what we should think about. Um, and there are four biases uh, in particular that are highly influential here that date back to caveman times. You see in here fear, drama, gap, and urgency. The gap bias in particular is really important for this topic because what the gap bias does is it has this focus on the differences, not the similarities. Because in the differences is the threat. In the differences is the discomfort. Uh, in the differences is the, the uh, possible um, uh, disruptor for us. And so uh, then if you think about that, no surprise, the things that are hardwired deep in every one of us uh, in terms of bias are things like uh, we're prejudiced to the poor. Um, we're prejudiced to the weak. Hate to say it, but one of the things where whether you're male or female, you're also prejudiced to is women. There's been a lot of studies on this. Um, so there's it, what we're focusing on is the gaps, and this is this shows up in current in the in the political environment in particular, um, it, it, how it shows up is you get so fixated on that small difference between yourself and another person that you lose sight of the fact that fundamentally what you have in common with every other person on this planet, um, whether they're Republican or Democrat or whatever, um, even, and this is true even between Eagles and Cowboys fans. Um, there, you have so much more in common, you should always feel connected and cooperative. But we don't because of that focus, this, this uh, gap, uh, this gap bias that has this focus on the differences. And you know what technology does? It feeds on that. It feeds on that. What, what uh, social media in particular is doing is trying to get us to spend more and more time on their platform because the more time we spend on their platform, the more valuable their ad space is and the more money they make. So, and this isn't, uh, uh, I've talked about in the past this uh, documentary called The Social Dilemma, which I, I highly recommend. The people who did this, they didn't do it deliberately. They're not uh, evil geniuses. Um, and actually, the, the originators of a lot of this technology, including an AI, are extremely worried as it advances and they can see the impact it's having on us as a species are extremely worried about it. Um, but this is how it works. It, uh, it, it picks up on our biases and it exploits those biases, uh, especially gap bias. So there are 180 biases. I'm not going to walk you guys through all of them. Even I'm, I would take my own life if I attempted that. Um, <clears throat> but there are a couple that I want to dig a little deeper on because they do affect our uh, ability to think critically, which is another uh, pet peeve of mine. I think there's far too little critical thinking uh, in the world these days, especially, I, I hate to say it, in uh, younger generations. Um, so the top ones are the most important. Authority bias, which is this notion that uh, uh, people in authority in particular are uh, more, they, they're more right than wrong. Um, so if somebody in authority says something, we're inclined to uh, take it at face value uh, and not process it uh, very deeply. Uh, and that includes, by the way, that if you read it, um, it must be true. That's also part of this because the fact that it got into print means it must be true because somebody must have you know, fact checked it, so it's, it's got to be right. Well, and here's a fact for you. Uh, most of our news sources these days have eliminated fact checking as a core competency. You know, even things like uh, the, the New York Times. Um, it's, a, it's expensive, and at the end of the day, what they've discovered is we don't really care. It gets in the way of, uh, of ad revenue. Um, confirmation bias. And this is a really important one as well. This is this notion that um, we are predisposed to look for things that bolster our point of view. 
and ignore things that don't. So, and if you ever get in an argument with somebody about something like politics, for instance, um, what you're going to get is confirmation bias. And earlier this week, I got into a really interesting conversation with uh, somebody um, that unfortunately moved into politics. And this is somebody that uh, I really liked, um, I think is a really good, decent person. And uh, on this little tiny sliver of life, um, we had some pretty fundamental disagreements. And as, as we were talking, or actually as I was listening, and <laughs> he was uh, kicking the living crap out of me to get me to come to my senses, um, I, you know, it's, it, it just reminded me there was nothing that I was going to say that was going to change his mind, reframe his way of looking at things, and nothing he was going to say that was going to do that to me. And so uh, ultimately what I did is said, hey, listen, um, you ain't selling me nothing, and I'm not going to sell you anything. So let's talk about something that we can all agree on, Something like, I don't know, um, the Eagles winning the next Super Bowl, something like that, um, and, uh, and, get, and get away from this very contentious uh, subject. That actually is not, it's not helpful. Um, and if, in fact, mo most of my points of view are probably faulty, as is are his. Uh, sunk cost bias is pretty important. Uh, the halo effect, also uh, very important. And this, this idea of availability cascade, which is the more you see it, the more you're predisposed to think that must be true, that must be right. Um, and certainly, uh, the internet is a big amplifier of this in terms of giving us more and more uh, touch points. Um, and then uh, the bottom list, also important, but the only one I want to touch on there, um, I, I want to get out ahead of this, is the, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, this is one that I think most of uh, my friends and family, people who know me, think I am the poster boy of the Dunning-Kruger effect. And um, anybody here who thinks that, uh, I just want to just get it out of the way. You don't actually know what you're talking about, okay? <laughs> so at the end of the day, we're hardwired uh, to be drawn to uh, some of these things. And I use the analogy of a, a moth to flame. Um, so we, just, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole for a second. Um, not, if anybody here is curious about the differences between moths and butterflies, so just a couple of quick things. Uh, uh, moths, they're, when, they, when they're motionless or when they're uh, stationary, their wings are flat. And butterflies uh, are up. Moths are nocturnal, and butterflies uh, move around during the day. Um, they, the two, they, they look very similar. They can't interbreed, which I, I think is super interesting. Um, but in terms of dominance, there's 160,000 species of moths, 17,000 species of butterflies. Moths are much more dominant, uh, in part because they, they move by night, and so they're not as susceptible to predators. But because they move by night, how they orient is on they use celestial navigation to uh, find their way around, to uh, move from you know, home base to wherever they're, they're going you know, in search of food or whatever, and then get back to home base. And uh, uh, light, you know, flame, light bulbs, et cetera, uh, screw them up. It's a, it's a big time head fake for uh, moths. So um, anybody else, yeah, should I keep going or not move on? <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Well, exactly, and, it, and anybody um, who finds themselves on Jeopardy and then they get moth questions <laughs> and kick butt, you owe me a piece of that. Just let's get that out of the way. Um, so as we, as we move into uh, how all this relates to AI and how all this relates to women in technology, uh, one of the things I, I feel very strongly about is that this is the year we're going to look back on AI and realize this is the year that AI mainstreams. So I, I was at a, a, the MDM conference earlier this week, which by the way, I would highly recommend. Um, every session, uh, every presentation, every panel discussion, uh, whether it was on organizational development, 
or Salesforce transmit, transformation uh, had an AI uh, element to it. Um, it this, is, this, is a, this is the year, and um, this is the year to uh, start figuring it out. If you're not already uh, getting uh, AI involved in your business or thinking about how to use AI in your business, um, you're, you're falling behind. So, um, oh, my graphic got a little screwed up here. Uh, and this is also fundamental to my way of thinking on this, right? So artificial intelligence, the fact of the matter is, is being coded by a bunch of white and Asian guys that are mainlining Red Bull and Mountain Dew and have, uh, I'll just, as a guy I can get away with saying this, questionable EQs. So um, think about that. What, what could possibly go wrong with AI? Right? So I, I, I think we may have just gotten to the root cause. Um, so, but the thing about AI is, and, and we're, we're talking a lot about what makes us nervous about it, what we're worried about, again, because that's our bias. We're looking for a threat. But the promise in AI eclipses that. And it's, you know, it's our job as leaders in the tech industry, as in, the influence that we have in the tech industry, is to make sure it does eclipse that. The potential for AI to positively transform society, transform the way we live, our kids live, our kids' kids live, is unbelievable. Uh, to solve, uh, help us solve existential threats, whether it's changes in the Earth's climate, um, you know, population density, uh, water distribution. I mean, it, 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 AI, um, has, the, has the potential, should lead to a much more enlightened society where you have no more wars. I mean, a lot of the things that, uh, that we're uh, killing each other over uh, completely and totally unnecessary. And it starts with being focused, highly, highly focused on our differences instead of our simula similarities. And I think um, AI has the opportunity has the ability to actually start to unwire us for bias. But because it's a product of us, it is actually being wired with our inherent biases, which is only going to, if we're not careful, amplify and make the situation worse. So, um, and this is this is a little out of order, but this is, this is my, uh, the, the premise behind what I was just talking about. I, I do think it has the opportunity to be the great equalizer. Um, you know, the vast majority of the, uh, there's way too many people in this world are living below the poverty level, worrying about how they're going to get clean drinking water for themselves and their family. Um, and by the way, drinking water still is, the, uh, unclean drinking water is still the number one source of disease in the world. Um, it, imagine if we can take that stuff away. If we can bring everybody up to a baseline standard of living, um, and the, the unlock that has for the economy, the number of new customers that comes online for each of our companies, it's a, it's a really important concept, and AI can help with this. Um, but in the meantime, what we have to do is acknowledge the fact that uh, real bias is being uh, hard-coded into AI. And this was uh, you know, a fundamental behind my original creation of uh, the first version of this slide deck back in uh, 2018. And this is a very recent example of how this manifests itself. Do you guys uh, realize that facial recognition is, uh, it's a huge thing. It's a $5 billion industry in the, in the US right now. And we've got cameras and facial recognition in airports, in school, all kinds of public places, in uh, city streets, and it's being used for lots of different things, not the least of which is finding criminals. And in this particular instance, an AI in Detroit identified this woman as a carjacker. And uh, the police showed up early morning, because that's the you know, best time to break into somebody's house is uh, early morning when, they're not, when everybody's sleeping, your kids are sleeping. It, I mean, this is just, this is awful and uh, arrested her, uh, took her, held her without due process for a while. It turns out she was uh, eight months pregnant, the stress triggered labor. Um, 
and only to realize that uh, their AI falsely identified her. And not the first time. I mean, it's, so, uh, and this is stuff that, you, know, it, you, you don't want to like put it on the front page of the newspaper if you're the, if you were behind the mistake. Uh, it's probably a lot more than this, but so, um, and, and, and this is just going to, uh, this is going to continue. We have to, we have to get on top of this. Um, one of the things I want to introduce you guys to is the partnership on AI. So th these are the things that make me hopeful. There are uh, very smart people and companies getting together to try and get in front of this, to try and create this pause that we started talking about so that we can uh, solve some of this before it, it gets too, too far out uh, in, in the world. And this woman, Carol Rose, is from the ACLU, um, and she's, uh, she's got a big voice in this. If you uh, read her feeds, uh, very interesting uh, what's going on here. But you know, Microsoft's engaged. And, and uh, so one of the other things I want to talk about with, with AI, which I also find very encouraging, is you know who the, the biggest alarm ringers are on AI, or at least the ones that are getting the, the most attention, are actually the Sam Altmans of the world, the, you know, the guy who, behind uh, ChatGPT. The AI people are saying, uh, hey, listen, um, this thing is, you know, we, we learned some lessons from uh, social media and how that jumped the shark. Uh, we need to be careful. We need to be careful here. Um, so it, I came across this, and, I, and it, it, this, I thought this was, this just kind of sums it up. It's actually not just uh, implicitly being hard coded in, it's explicitly being hard coded in. So if, just take, take this. Uh, quick quiz in terms of, these are four AIs, and what AI would you think of for question number one? You know, to call me a taxi or, uh, and I, I think the answer is, you know, Alexis or Siri, named after women. There's a, there's a women con connotation there, right? And then if you're asking an AI for uh, something more technical or whatever, it's you know, Watson or uh, Einstein. Um, which is kind of interesting. So right up front, there's this kind of subtle push um, when it comes to uh, AI. Now, by the way, this, this uh, picture from, of Einstein uh, comes from um, humandigital.com, which is, it, which is super interesting. I think I got that right. Um, but they, uh, Einstein is an AI that uh, I think has been developed by... Um, uh, I want to say Salesforce, and um, it's it's pretty incredible. But it's got a, a kind of quasi physical manifestation, or it's it's a three D image that moves as it's talking and that kind of stuff. That's uh, it's it's mesmerizing, um, and it's going. It, and I won't get into it, but it's it's leading to some other really interesting uh, ways where technology is integrating into us by. Uh, looking like us, feeling like us, make it, it's a lot easier for us to inter uh, interact with. Um, so, and this is, some, this is a, a quote from a professor at Arizona State University that uh, I first came across in 2017 that's really stuck with me because I, I think it, it, it really sums things up pretty nicely. And uh, what she was talking about in a lecture is how you know, machines, AI, or, you know, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, et cetera, is going to manipulate her beliefs about what she should pursue, what she should leave alone, whether or not she wants kids, get married, uh, wh what kind of job she should uh, go for, and things you know, like what she should buy. Guys, this is happening to all of us uh, every day. When you, do, uh, when you go on Amazon to, and it comes up with recommendations about other things that it think you would like, I mean, think about um, how often you pause and look at those and maybe even take action. And that is AI uh, influencing us. Um, and it's, it's, it's iterative. So it's looking at how it's influenced other people and how other people have taken action. It's making it, looking at your patterns, making assumptions and correlations, and then putting things in front of you that uh, frankly are uh, irresistible. 
So as we, as we start to look at what I think is uh, one of the problems related to uh, this group and this conference, it's no surprise, I think, uh, it's lack of women, not just in technology, but specifically in the AI part of technology. So at Facebook, 15% of the researchers in AI are women. It's worse at Google. It's, uh, it's less at Google. 12% uh, of all machine learning researchers are women. Um, I'll, and I'll say it again. Women are underrepresented in uh, the creation of AI. So I, I think the next one's uh, no, not quite. Uh, this is also a, um, I, I would encourage everybody, it's another documentary that I love. It's on Netflix. It's called Coded Bias. I introduced you guys in 2018 to uh, uh, Joy Balam, Balam I, uh, oh boy, I knew I was gonna screw this up. And I actually practiced this. And oh, there's a, there's a cool website where if you don't know how to pronounce something, you can plug it in. And it doesn't matter what, it will uh, just keep doing it until you get it right. And believe it or not, I put Joy's name in there. Uh, Balam, Balam, anyway. Um, this is a really important documentary because it not only covers you know, her journey with unmasking uh, facial recognition issues with AI, which, you know, she worked with uh, developing a, a large AI model. What she was finding is the AI just wouldn't see her. I mean, literally would not see her. And if she put this white mask on, instantly saw her. Yeah. And so she, she uh, talks about that. There are other really important people in the field in this documentary, Kathy O'Neill, um, who wrote the, uh, uh, the uh, kind of definitive book uh, capturing a lot of this um, and that I highly recommend. So um, for anybody who wants to see more about this, um, please take a look at that. So uh, as I, I, I move to the end, I want to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, the gaps here, and this is, a, this is an update on some C-suite stats that I've shared uh, many times with the audience. 5% um, decline in uh, SVP roles from a, a high of 18%. So at senior leadership, um, there's a, a move backwards. 10% of C-suite roles uh, occupied by uh, women today. This has got to piss you off, right? 27% pay cut for women CEOs versus men, who saw an increase. Um, might have something to do with men still are predominant in board of directors, which you'll see here in a second. And 5.5% uh, of the 3,000 largest American firms uh, have a woman CEO, and I'll show you some more uh, stats on that. Um, I started talking about this slide earlier, and, and I stopped myself, so I, I, I won't repeat it. But um, I do want to show you the kind of the results of this survey and the disconnect between how men see the challenges that women have in the workforce and how women see the challenges uh, that they have. So right up front, 40% uh, of the respondents uh, picked this as one of the uh, top three challenges for women in the workforce, which is women are judged by different standards. Now, for men, they also uh, recognize that, but only 14% included this in, in their top three responses. Uh, when you go to the next one, which is women don't receive as much sponsorship, 32% um, versus 12%. You know, uh, We's got an amazing program for mentorship, and which is a, a synonym for sponsorship, um, I, and I think this is extremely important because clearly there's a, a perception gap here. Women less likely to be promoted to first level manager roles. I mean, we've seen facts on that. Um, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and number one most popular answer for men was there are too few qualified women in the pipeline. And um, that, that's, not, uh, that's awful. Um, but 13% of the women respondents also uh, identified that. Um, and it's fixable. So as, as we move, as I move to a, to wrap this up, I'm going to concentrate on that. When you look at the Fortune 500 CEO count, uh, 52 women in 2023 are CEOs in the Fortune 500, about 10% uh, of the population. Actually, we lost one. Um, 
Roz Brewer, who was the CEO of Walgreens, uh, recently stepped down. Um, Walgreens uh, earnings and, and then consequently their stock price is just getting, getting hammered flat. Um, actually hammered flat by CVS, which is also women led, which is kind of uh, interesting. But the number 52 st still sticks because um, Elon Musk in all his enlightenment has hired a woman to run Twitter. So we still have uh, 52 uh, women CEO in the Fortune 500. Um, I wanted to share this with you because I, I, there's a couple of things about this. One, I think uh, uh, Ann Wojcicki, this is another one I plugged into the thing, Wojcicki, um, is a uh, fabulous example of somebody taking action. The, by the way, uh, 23andMe is the only uh, Silicon Valley tech company that employs more women than men. The only one. And you can see some stats here. 53% of their employees are women, 38% of leadership. Uh, Anne's a, a very impressive. Um, she got a, a degree in biology from Harvard. And um, she and, uh, she's, was born in 1973. So when I do the math, it puts her about 50 years old. Um, she makes $32 million a year, um, which is uh, in and of itself pretty cool. Um, but when you think about the fact that it is uh, 32 million represents 10% of 23andMe's revenue and over 30% of their margin, um, that is a uh, outsized uh, take home for, uh, for any CEO. Um, and this is something I'm going to share with my board of directors. I think that's a good benchmark. I'll take 10% uh, <laughs> of our revenue. Uh, uh, Alyssa from Andrews is here and she's, even she's laughing. So. It's, I, I don't think I have a chance. Um, so one of the things uh, that is helping and will continue to help is the representation at board level uh, for women is uh, getting better. Uh, some, in some states like California, this is mandated. Um, I, this does help. I mean, you are, this, this will over time uh, make a difference. So I'm happy to see that. And I, I've talked about this before, and this is how I'm going to wrap this up. Why diversity matters. Why are we why are, are we talking about this? Um, and diversity matters for lots of reasons. First and foremost, for me, it's the right thing. I mean, it's just the right thing. Um, but it's also the smart thing. Diverse groups outperform non-diverse groups. Uh, teams make better decisions than individuals 67% of the time. And for gender and uh, ethnically diverse teams, it jumps to 87% of the time. Why wouldn't you want that advantage, right? Um, but as we've just seen, so many companies aren't taking advantage of this advantage um, because of their lack of diversity on their teams. Gender equality is extremely important for business. And uh, you've heard a lot about this. It's been talked about uh, actually in, in Jackie's opening remarks. Um, and one of the reasons why is gender diverse teams are more innovative than non-gender diverse teams. And innovation is the source for, I, I would argue, virtually any company. Innovation is the source for uh, increased market share at better than market margins. Increased market share at better than market margins. And for a for-profit business, holy grail. And so gender diversity uh, is a contributor to there. So, uh, and I, I would say to any, anybody, even if you don't believe this, you should do it um, because it uh, improves your bottom line. Um, and this is also very evident in women-led companies. Uh, in women, women-led companies uh, outperform and have been for quite a while, men-led companies. It, it, is that? Startle you guys? Yeah, yeah it's, um, it's, it's the data. You know, here's some examples, including uh, Roz Brewer, who I'm going to have to take off of this slide, unfortunately. Maybe she'll pop back up someplace else. Um, so Mackenzie's done a lot of work on this in terms of quantifying it. So you, you don't have to take my uh, word on this. You can look at some hard data. The economic impact is massive. So it's not just for companies. It's for government, it's for all of us, 
This is extremely important when you think about where the debt is today, um, you know, what the deficit is today, um, I mean, we're, we're trillions of dollars. So if you can improve the GDP by trillions of dollars, uh, it, ma it makes a world of difference. It's truly uh, transformative. And so as I, as I, I bring this to the close, I, I think this is fundamental to everything I've been talking about. So it's this, it's this duopoly when it comes to the purpose of a company. You know, it, and you'll see this on the survey. I'm really interested in, in, in how everybody thinks about this. Should companies have uh, social responsibility or not? Is it, it, or is companies number one and only responsibility to their shareholders? Um, and there, there's, this is not new. Um, what's new is perhaps that it's getting talked about, and what's new is there's you know, ESG uh, initiatives for, at least at the moment, public companies. Um, but it goes back to, so another common theme uh, in economics these days um, is the fact that we, do, we apparently don't manufacture anything in the US anymore, which, by the way, I can tell you is wrong. Um, my company sells directly to companies who make stuff in the US, and it's, uh, it's all over the place. I, I, I love that part of my job, getting to see that. But in, in the 80s, we did start a trend of outsourcing manufacturing uh, to China in particular in order to improve our bottom lines. It was more cost effective because of labor and, and there was le less uh, regulation there that we had to contend with, et cetera. Um, it was good for shareholders. Um, now, of course, the last few years, that's become a bit of a problem because of supply chain resiliency. And then, of course, um, uh, China has gotten bigger, stronger. Um, they've got more leverage in their relationships with us which uh, horrifies us and pisses us off. And oh, by the way, we, are there. we enabled all of that. So I think it's a little disingenuous to, uh, personally, I think to brand China as uh, the evil empire. Um, uh, they're just doing what we did before them as we industrialized. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, that's, that's what happened. Without regard for what was long-term good for society. And what's happening, uh, has happened and continues to happen in technology is new technology comes along um, and it's being introduced without general regard for its impact on society. And again, this isn't, I don't think this is a deliberate thing um, because I don't think these people are uh, deliberately bad people, uh, not even close. Um, but it's, it's hard for us to extrapolate out what something, the impact, AI's been uh, in the works for something like uh, 40 years, and maybe closer to 60 years. And um, so in the, for the vast majority of that time, I don't think it was possible for uh, the people that were involved in this moving it forward to understand exactly uh, how it might bite us uh, in the future. Um, and so it, what they were after is, you know, build a company with a stellar valuation because they're crazy innovative, and again, innovation drives uh, market share and margin. Um, and in some cases, frankly, they had developed something that they thought was like super cool and just sort of a bias towards it, and they want to see it mainstream, right? All perfectly normal, logical uh, human uh, reactions to things. But one, we, here we are, and we, we need to stop and think about this, is, uh, you know, what what do we expect of companies? As a shareholder, and I'm a shareholder of lots of things, um, I like the fact that uh, companies, uh, management teams, are focused on profitability, uh, increasing the value of my share. I think that's extremely important. But at the, at the expense of the future, mm, not, not so much. So this is, this is something that uh, you know, uh, companies have to wrestle with these days. You know, in, uh, uh, especially uh, public companies, and, and have to think about. So I think it is a fundam fundamental part of all of this. So, you know, in terms of, of, of path forward, what I, I want to focus on as it relates to us today is, you know, this build a and fill a pipeline of diverse talent and then retain them. Not, not an easy thing to do, but it's, it's ultimately how we get to the root cause of some of this. Um, 
And I finished up in 2018 with this slide, and I think it's as true as ever. Uh, we can all make a difference on this. Uh, we can make the case for diversity with our leadership teams. Um, there are real advantages that we can speak to. It's not just how we feel. Um, the numbers uh, show that this is a smart thing to do. Um, I think it's also each of us individually can kind of take a little closer look in the mirror about our own biases and try and keep those in mind as we move forward and then uh, deliberately hire for diversity as well as talent. And, and trust me, I, it, this is not an easy thing to do. Um, it's, uh, it, it's also something that AI should be able to help us with, though so far it isn't. There was a, a famous fail on this. A Amazon used an AI uh, to try and get a more diverse candidate pool for the jobs that they had open. And what they quickly discovered is there were fewer and fewer women in the resumes they were looking at. The, uh, the AI was screening women out. Now, there's a lot of things going on today with using AI to uh, screen uh, resumes for open positions. And one of the things that's starting to be talked about right now is if you don't know the AI uh, decoder ring, your resume is not going to get looked at. There are, so if you do, it's an advantage to you. If you don't, it's a disadvantage, regardless of your accomplishments or experience. So, um, but hiring for diversity as well as talent, uh, extremely important. Generally, kind of the old model is hire for talent. And then when you uh, wake up one day and you've got a building full of uh, middle-aged white guys, you can say, well, I got the best talent. Um, what, am, what am I going to do? Uh, that's, that's, that's not going to cut it. Um, and you may have great talent, but without diversity, you don't have a great team. So it deliberately be inclusive. And um, as we get progress, it's going to create momentum. And momentum's got this flywheel effect uh, that makes everything easier. So as I close, a lot of the images in this uh, were generated with AI. So if you guys haven't played around with things like a Fodor or a Hot Pot, um, a Canva, um, the ChatGPT AI, this just reminds me of something else I wanted to share that I think is fascinating. ChatGPT AI for images is called uh, Dali. And um, so I made this image and uh, with um, freestyle AI, and my, um, my prompt was do an artistic rendering of what is on the mind of modern women. And this is what I got back. And which just confirmed, I don't know anything about women. <laughs> <laughs> but what, the re re reason I left this in here is because then I took this image I was, I was curious about the, the image. Uh, it took about 60 seconds to create, and I plugged it into the Google image search algorithm, and it came back with a lot of other images that were really close to this one. So what I realized is this wasn't truly unique to my prompt, that the AI went out and looked at other image AIs uh, uh, to, as a starting point. Um, so even there, there's this homogenization going on. But and, it, and by the way, I just I think it's a super cool image. But um, there is a piece of it that's absolutely terrifying. Um, so with that, I, I think I'm about right on close to on time. Yes, and we have time for questions and answers. So if you want to do that, we're then then we've got time for one more little share that I, I missed. Uh, so and this this harkens back to the uh, the bias in AI. Um, you know one of the most pronounced biases in AIs today? Political bias. So there was a, a study of 14 large language models done. Um, you know, the, all the biggies, you know, chat GPT, et cetera. And uh, there was a series of questions of, uh, asked, the same question, 62 questions asked of each of these uh, models to try to determine uh, what their political bias was. And lo and behold, there's a very pronounced political bias. Um, um, chat GPT, liberal, uh, the meta, not so liberal. Um, so it's, it's interesting, but when you stop and you think about, okay, how does, this, how does this happen? So you know how these large language models are programmed? 
is they, they consume lots of data sources. And depending upon uh, what they're focused on, whether it's you know, printed material versus the internet, et cetera, um, some of the, the largest ones you know, have hoovered up the Library of Congress and anything that's been digitized, um, as well as everything that's on the internet. So no surprise that the biases of the authors of those material are getting their biases worked up into these large language models. And depending upon the focus of the model, it tends to, uh, then you start getting things like uh, political bias, which I think is really interesting. And why that's, why that's important is, you know, that, the first step to fixing a problem is actually understanding that you have a problem and acknowledging a problem. Um, so I, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was really interesting. And then one of the things that jumped out at me in reading that study is um, the biases, they're not static. They change as the models evolve and learn more. So I'll, get, I'll give you a, a, for instance, in chat GPT 2, the second version of chat GPT thought uh, that the wealthy should be taxed more. It was very clear, wealthy should be taxed more. Chat GPT 3, very clear, the wealthy should be taxed less. So, I mean, that's, uh, I, I thought that was pretty interesting.